I am joined by Stelios. Hello. And Harry Miller of Fair Cop. Very great. pleased to have you. Yeah, great to be here. Great to be here. And uh, I've actually pulled up your website here. So uh, you can explain a little bit about it because I imagine <laughs> you've been very busy and I'm probably going to unintentionally direct a lot more traffic your way. So sorry about that. But we, we have been busy. I mean, we've been inordinately busy. I can't believe that uh, all my predictions about Keir Starmer, that a, a Labour government would be exactly the same as the Conservative government, that it would simply be a different coloured tie on the doorstep of number 10. Uh, I, well, it shows how, what a great political forecaster I am, because it seems to me that Starmer has been born fully formed as Chairman Mao, mm -hmm. um, and he's taken all of the great... Um, officers of state uh, state with him the the notion that we have a separation of powers well that's now ancient history because all of the powers that there are in this country seem to be operating under the sole direction of um, of Herr Starmer and um, and um, uh, uh, Yvette Cooper which is which is troubling if you if you are remotely interested in freedom, if you're remotely interested in preserving the rights of the individual over the state, preserving autonomy, then the sharp turn to, I don't even know whether it's to the left, the sharp turn to Maoism um, has got to be extremely concerning. And I think that's probably uh, the reason why we are so busy. We've picked up on, on our X account, uh, we increased our numbers by, I think, between 5 and 10% within the first fortnight uh, of, of Starmer getting in, because what he's done immediately is generate a chilling effect on free speech anybody who is slightly to the right anybody who voted for brexit anybody who has a who's expressed a view about immigration anybody who has expressed a view about limiting who is allowed to live here and woe betide anybody who's expressed a, be, a view about where terrorism in this country uh, seems to be stemming from well if you're in that group or one of those groups, then you are in severe danger of coming to the attention of Keir Starmer's um, state. And that is terrifying. People are terrified. So, so far, you know, if, if one of the key performance indicators of a new government is to create a chilling effect, then we've got to give Keir Starmer 10 out of 10. Mm. But what you do here is you provide people with the means to um, resist the police potentially persecuting their speech as well as I think you also help um, police officers being persecuted by the sort of institution as well as I yeah. understand yeah 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 we, 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 we do we do all of that uh, I think at some point we're going to have to produce some form of toolkit as to as to what to do on Saturday night I addressed um, a group of round about I think it was about 300 uh, largely women on um, on an ex spaces meeting on a Saturday mm -hmm. night. That's a lot of people, um, and th the majority of them were concerned about what do we do if we get a knock on the door. Well, my advice is this: give yourself just the once over check. Have I done something wrong? Have I committed a crime? Do I think that this knock on the door? is warranted because one of the things about committing a crime is you're supposed to know you've committed it all right that's the element of, of what we call mens rea the guilty mind you don't commit crimes or most crimes unintentionally most crimes are committed with the intention of causing hurt damage it's the guilty mind it's one part it's one part of what constitutes a crime guilty mind plus guilty action minus a defense so just Check with yourself. Have you been stalking somebody? Have you been harassing somebody? Have you been threatening somebody? And if the answer to all those questions is no, then there's a fair chance you have not committed a crime. So the next thing that you have to do is this. You have to ask the police officer, are you investigating me for a crime or for a non-crime? If they say we're investigating you for a non-crime, you have the option of that door of shutting the door and kiss, telling them to kiss their ass goodbye. If they say they're investigating you for a crime, the first thing you need to do at that point is turn your phone recorder on. At that point, what they should do is caution you. That's straight away. The second they the, the second that they have identified you as somebody who is the possible uh, perpetrator of a crime, they are the suspect suspect in a crime. You have to be cautioned. You have to be cautioned. So. Be on the lookout for that. Stick your tape recorder on. And then don't agree to do anything 
without first uh, speaking to me and definitely without seeing a solicitor now one of the great what, what what tends to happen these days is that the police rather than arrest you which is a bit messy the police will into will ask you or invite you for an interview under caution now the thing with an inter, with, with an invite to an interview under caution a voluntary interview is you can say no what tends to happen is they say if i don't if, if you say no we'll arrest you so it's worth asking that if they ask you to go to a voluntary interview ask the question what happens if i say no if they say well we might have to arrest you then we are generating a for, for a future claim of coercion here all right if you do go in for a voluntary interview a make sure you take a solicitor and b make sure you take your phone or some other recording device and record them because it's voluntary you can do that you don't even need to tell them you're recording it just record it and then once you've done that send it to me and we'll have a look at it because nine times out of ten the police will have they're, they're all, all they'll have done they'll have been on a fishing trip they'll have been on a fishing trip that's it and we can then we then have the means to fight back because unless the police have objective grounds genuine objective grounds for believing that you have committed an offense they have no right whatsoever to be approaching you on that basis what they want to do is get you down into an interview they want to scare the life out of you tell you that on this occasion it will probably no go for go no further and leave you with their words ringing in your ear so that you back off and become state compliant without ever troubling the criminal justice system that's what they want to do and it's our job not to play with them it's our job not to play ball it's our job to think of a way to defend ourselves and to turn the boot onto them that's what fair cop does I have a question. I heard you saying before that people should turn the recording on if the police says, if the people knocking on the door say that we are investigating you for a crime. Yeah. But how will, let's say they say we're investigating you for a non-crime. Turn, turn it on, turn it on. The, yeah, the second it's the police, turn on the recording. How device. will pe the people be able to prove something because if they don't have any recording it's going to be the police officer's words against them right so most most people have a recording device most people have got an iphone or some form of smartphone you need to familiar familiarize yourself beforehand yeah. with how to record a conversation it's quite easy voice memos or what have you just make sure it's there you make sure you know how to do it and then before you open the door you press the record button it's as simple as that yeah. we have we have helped a, a huge amount of people on the basis that they've recorded the they've recorded the interview because we've then unpicked it and said if there was no caution there was no basis for the interview what they were doing was simply investigating the fact that somebody had been offended but they were not on they were they were entirely unable to attach that offense to a legitimate crim crime and if we can do all that we are then in a position where we can we can a get you off the hook because you shouldn't have been on the hook in the first place and b turn the tables on the police and, and then make them answer for their behavior make them answer for their behavior what i'm looking for in the next in the next year or so is for this to happen to somebody and for us to then make a criminal case against the police for harassment a public order case against the police for harassment because let's face it if you went up to somebody's somebody's door as a, as a complete stranger knocked on their door and said by the way you have to do what i say otherwise i'm going to i'm going to lock you up and take away your freedom you would consider that to be harassment okay well why should be yeah absolutely why is it any different because it's a police officer doing it the only way a police officer has a uh, can do that it's not by virtue of their uniform it's not by virtue of the police car it's not by virtue of they have that they physically have the power to do it it's because they have been given they have been granted by the state an extraordinary power the power to investigate crime and the power to threaten an arrest and to make an arrest but if they are if they are abusing that power or if they are simply using it negligently because they haven't thought it through then they need to be taken to task 
they need to be taken to task so what we're looking for actively looking for is cases where we can not only go against the police and show you were wrong not only go against the police and say we want a bit of conversation but go against the police and say now prosecute yourself prosecute that officer prosecute whoever ordered that officer to come around prosecute the chief constable if they've created it prosecute whoever but you as police officers cannot do this you cannot unleash hell against the public and give yourself a pass because you happen to be in uniform we're not having it here here and i think that one thing that isn't done enough and, and part of the reason that things have been allowed to get to this point in the first place is that people haven't really gone on the attack against the institutions that are persecuting them more or less we've sort of been saying well they shouldn't do that please reform we're not actually pushing back and saying actually we should prosecute you and i think that that's a really important step because one of the things that i think that has changed uh, the nature of policing is things like the black lives matter protests for example that i've heard from multiple different police officers that following those protests they were far more afraid to deal with black criminals basically and they, they actively avoided um, trying to investigate those crimes in a to a degree far greater than they would have otherwise and so um, I think this ties in very nicely to the fact that the police no longer necessarily seem to care nearly as much about what is right and wrong and more so about their appearance and their reputation and I think that had they looked at you know doing the right thing they wouldn't have to worry about their reputation but they're doing it in the sort of short term and I think there's a lot of political pressure going on here you've got the police and crime commissioners um, exerting political pressure and there's a, a, a more cosy relationship which you alluded to um, earlier I think between um, politicians and the police that are incentivizing these sorts of things and I think that um, I've been told at, at least that if you're to get beyond the rank of inspector you need some sort of understanding of politics and there's also an element of it as well which I was quite shocked to hear um, this is from I believe the Met Police I was told um, that you need to have basically grasped on one of your colleagues to get beyond the, the rank of inspector and this is normally for something that is sort of politically correct so for misogyny or they might say something off colour or there might be a bad joke and you need to have that on your record that actually you're willing to uphold standards against your colleagues but what that does is it creates a very um, clear climate of basically political fear within the police I think and it gets them in line with the political messaging that the only way that you can maintain your career in, in policing is that you more or less follow the political prevailing wind and you enforce that and you do basically the bidding of politicians. Uh, that, that, that's right I had a very sad case about two years ago where a, um, a traffic officer formerly of um, Hampshire police now working at a different force very experienced traffic officer he was on a he was on a, i think it was a night shift with a, a very long-standing colleague someone who he thought of as a friend someone who he trusted uh, during the night shift they happened to make a comment about oh where's pc so-and-so this week and he said oh he's on one of these flipping diversity courses, isn't he and they got chatting about it and the, the police officer said well what, what a waste of time they are he said all they do is teach people that men can become women well i don't believe any of that nonsense his mate reported him his mate reported him yeah and the reason that his mate reported him was because everything in that car was being recorded anyway so if he'd failed to report his mate for that then he could have been seen to be condoning it if they'd been a, there'd been a spot check on the conversations that had taken place in that car now what that does one it it what they did with the police officer they put him through um they put him through an investigation uh, he he's a Christian so he he said look really I don't need you to be I, I am considering making claim against you because you're discriminating against me based on my religion so they said okay we don't do that what we want to do is send you on a re-education course the old re-education course uh, so that that was that was what they want to do to change his thinking to drive out any any belief system the, that he had and replace it with an approved policing system but you can't have a situation where on a night shift or even a day shift you you can't you are afraid to make conversation with your colleague because there is an inordinate pressure on your colleague to report you if you say anything that is off script that is utterly 
demoralizing one of the things you need to be when it's when it comes to working for any of the services army fire service i guess ambulance service certainly the police is you need to have absolute trust in your colleagues because on a daily basis you are going into horrendous situations horrendous situations one of the coping mechanisms is honesty brutal honesty black humor i mean we used to use black humor all of the time as does every single emergency service every single person who's ever been in that situation throughout history has resorted to black humor well, now unfortunately we here yeah, as well now unfortunately if you if you resort to black humor there's a fair chance that you're going to be reported for it and there's a fair chance you're going to face a disciplinary and you're going to be taken off being an active police officer as you await disciplinary you're going to be on full pay this this these processes take months and months and months and at the end of the day you know you you have very good police officers who are thoroughly demoralized and who are leaving the job and who is replacing them diversity hires diversity hires we have the ludicrous situation uh, fairly local to me actually where a, a pakistani woman was um was taken from the community to become a a, a police officer she was due to be fast-tracked to detective um and it all started going very very wrong within the first few weeks because a she didn't think that she should be made to work weekends b she nobody had told her that she was supposed to work nights uh, and c 12 hour days were far too long anyway what did they think they were doing and it took them forever to get rid of her. Why? Because she was a diversity hire. That's where that's where we're at. What you're describing completely destroys any element of collegiality. Right. And I think it uh, can be extended throughout culture because what we are the what we are encountering on a daily basis is basically an informant culture. Yeah. There are incentives in every organization for people to rat on each other. Well, I agree, but the, the, the other thing about this particular officer is she quite openly, quite openly stated that she wanted to join the police in order to put the police correct, right culturally following the Sarah Everard incident. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, if you're a police constable and you recruit, it is not your job to be sorting out systemic problems, systematic cultural problems within the whole of the police. It's your job to come in, do your job, arrest the bad guy, do long shifts, go to traffic accidents, go to domestics, do all of that crappy day-to-day -day stuff. And then maybe one day when you've proven yourselves way down the line, maybe you'll get lucky and maybe you'll invite you to go and join the Mandarins at the College of Policing, where you can fill your boots um, with political nonsense and uh, leave policing as a thing on your CV. Because you, once you join the College of Policing, you'll never do any policing again. So one thing that I have um, sort of thought about here is that because there is this sort of informant culture, as Stelios put it, within the police, I think it justifies it in many police officers' minds to apply this to the population at large. Because if it's the conditions they live under, then, all, well, it must at least be somewhat justified to apply that to other people. And so the, the, this level of scrutiny, this very high level of scrutiny of political statements, well, they must be looking at it through their... Um, sort of internal lens of what can I get away with and looking at the populace at large and, and enforcing those standards upon people right just from a sort of almost psychological sense I, I, I'm not sh I'm not sure whether it's personal or not uh, quite like that what I am certain is is that the standard of recruit is so abysmally poor um, that there is no real understanding of the difference between law well, you know what is legal and what's just you know nice or what's fantasy. not nice and what's fantasy no and the police i've said this before but it's true it needs saying again the police seem to be far more concerned about being on what they consider to be the right side of history than they are about being on the right side of the law if they think that the society is moving in a certain direction where being offensive is an offense then they will treat being offenses offensive as an offense right now they'll treat it that way right now even though they know being offensive is not an offense yeah They'll treat it as such, which is why we had four years ago the ludicrous um, uh, sight of a uh, of a twelve foot billboard being trailed around the Wirral uh, that said by, by the police that said being offensive is an offence. I remember we've, that. We've yeah. had we've had to pull up um, Derbyshire police for tweeting out being offensive is an offence. We've reported numerous other police forces and said, but it isn't. It isn't being offensive. It's not. It might not be nice, but you're not the nice police. You're the law police. It's your job to police the law, 
not to get ahead of, of the law not to predict what the law might be in 10 years time and certainly not to impose the law as you wish it was it's your job to impose the law as it is and if you don't like it well suck it up sister do it anyway or stop being a police officer there's also this phenomenon here that I found very interesting covering some of the, the recent riots. And that is the fact that many Muslims came out on the street with weapons and I think it may have been, is that a community support officer? Um, I'm not entirely sure. But basically there were the, the official line and, and what I think was actively and institutionally enforced in many police forces was that certain communities are more... Um, suited to being community policed so in muslim communities they may have their imams who they listen to it's almost like the police are not seen as the legitimate force and you see the riot in leeds where many muslims were involved and this seemed to my mind to be a sort of rejection of the legitimacy of british law it was rejecting the notion that the police can be involved and they were driven out of the community um, and we're seeing the continuation of that and i'm told um from police officers that they're actually taught to treat certain communities differently deliberately so yeah, um, yeah I, I, absolutely i mean let, let, let's take let's take this that we see here okay um addressing a crowd that's fully tooled up and saying look guys what i'd really like you to do is just we'll not arrest anybody but if you don't mind just going and putting your weapons in the mosque mm. uh, that that'd be really really cool okay can you imagine saying that to a bunch of big fat white guys wrapped in union flags who were carrying weapons can you imagine a police officer standing before them and saying guys would you mind just dipping back to weatherspoons and leaving your weaponry there you can pick it up after but right now please take your please take your weapons your your, your cloches your, your your knuckle dusters your, your bats you know all the rest of it just go and, just go and leave them at weatherspoons just go and leave them at weatherspoons you can pick them up later would that ever happen it would not happen in a million years you see a group that you know have got weapons if they if they're flying union flags if they're if they're white what you do you call in the big guns you call in the cannons you call in the water hoses you call in the helicopters you call in every every riot squad uh, in the area because you are not going to back down to that crowd you are not going to do anything to that crowd other than subdue it and arrest as many people as you can and confiscate as many weapons as you can now that's what they should be doing here if you're out on the street as a group with a weapon I, no quarter should be given to you whatsoever no pleasers no thank yous we're going to take your weapons off you we're going to arrest you and we're going to put you inside for as long as the justice system will allow because we are not having this we are simply not having this and it's instances like this which people see which which make us say that there is two tier policing and it doesn't matter that sir mark rowley says there isn't there clearly is it's irrelevant that keir starmer says there isn't we've got it documented yvette cooper is dreaming if she thinks we haven't noticed that there has been two tier policing on our streets for a very very long time and we know there is because we can predict with a high degree of accuracy how a police force will operate on any given moment you tell me what group it is they're going to police and i will tell you with a degree of accuracy how they will police it if it's left wing if it's blm if it's if it's um climate change it will be one way if it's a bunch of, of women who believe that women are women and women don't have penises, if it's a bunch of people who are concerned about immigration, etc., it will be policed in an entirely different way. And we will be right about that every single time. We've got an... Ex oh, sorry, Stelios. In a, just in a bit. Um, we've actually got an example of this from the Palestine uh, protests here, um, where... 80 of the counter-protesters were arrested by police in riot gear, whereas the people more or less dressed as Hamas, chanting for genocide, um, and even carrying, some were carrying swastikas, were allowed to carry on. Um, but sorry, Stelios, do go ahead. No, I just wanted to say about the two-tier policing thing. Not only do we have ample evidence, but uh, Yvette Cooper and Keir Starmer, they're lying when they're saying that there isn't, because they're pro-multiculturalism, and multiculturalism is all about granting group-differentiated rights, which manifests in this case in the problem you just mentioned that some some people are allowed to get away with things that people from other from white communities aren't 
Yeah. So I think that the police view themselves as only the legitimate authority of the the British people and not other ethnicities. Uh, I think that that's the way things are being treated at the minute. And um, you can look at things like the anti-lockdown protests uh, when we were, you know, in, in the COVID times compared with the Black Lives Matter protests and the difference between the two. Well, the anti-lockdown protests were not treated with kid gloves, whereas the Black Lives Matter ones were certainly um, treated um, with a certain amount of reverence, even, you could say. And, and also the Sarah Everard um, mm. uh, pr protests uh, that, that occurred then. It seemed that the police were far more interested in cracking down on on the protest than they were in sympathising uh, with it and allowing it to run as, you know, as giving them as much leeway as possible. Uh, because I, th I think the police are unfortunately, and I hate to say this, the police are primarily about protecting themselves. I mean, we, again, we, we know this objectively. When, when in 2014 we had the nonsense of non-crime hate incidents, and um, just to remind your, your listeners and viewers, that a non-crime hate incident was any incident that didn't quite reach the quality of being crime, but which was nevertheless an incident perceived by either the victim or any other person to be motivated by hate. The guidance said it must be recorded against the individual as a non-crime hate incident. No leeway, it must be. We put in a um, subject access request to the Metropolitan Police and said, how many non-crime hate incidents have been recorded against police officers between 2014 and 2021? And the answer came back, zero. Absolutely zero. That can't be right. Because if you just do a cursory look of the internet, the, the police are very often accused of disablism, racism, sexism, all sorts of stuff. Now, they may not have committed a crime, but it doesn't matter. The guidance that they were operating under said that where there wasn't a crime, they must be recorded for a non-crime agent. So why, Mr. Police Officer, were you not recording yourself? Why were you only persecuting the public, but you were giving yourself an absolute total pass? Okay. Why is that? One of the particularly insidious parts of this is that... Um, these non-crime hate incidences will come up in an advanced background check to, as well. So yeah. say you're applying for a job that requires that, well, that's going to then come up, even though you've not done anything wrong by the law. Correct, correct. correct. That's why, we, you know, it was such a great victory that we had in 20, uh, 2020 or 2021, was it? Um, where we got all of that non-crime hate incident stuff um, struck down. Now, we didn't get it entirely struck down, the, and we never argued for it to be entirely struck down. We said the police can record non-crime hate incidents but it's down to them to justify doing it so if you've got a situation if you've gathered some intelligence about people and the intelligence you've gathered doesn't suggest that there's a crime yet taken place but it gives a strong indicator that the person you are looking at is likely to be committing a crime in the near future then of course we want you to record that against that person that's the job of policing of course we do but you can't do that legitimately if at the same time you're recording people because they said, for instance, my cat's a Methodist. That's not an indicator of a crime anyway. If you're recording the fact that I said, um, I, I, was, I, was, I, I was assigned mammal at birth, but I, I identify as a fish. That's not me indicating to the police that I'm about to embark on a life of crime, is it? It's not. It's simply a free expression. So... Even if, in, even if in that sort of quarter of a million non-crime hate instance that the police recorded, there may well have been some very, very interesting stuff in there, but you lost it all in the noise. You lost it all in the noise. Too much information is every bit as bad as too little information. Yeah. That's what, that was what is going wrong here. So one final thing before I bring this segment to a close is this statement here. So Elon Musk labelled the UK a police state. Do you? I don't know whether you've actually read what he has said, yeah. but um, what are your your thoughts on that? Uh, what, what, what does he mean by police state? What we have in this country, um, and the same in the states, is we have to a degree a separation of powers, where we have where we have the the government, we have the judiciary, and we have the police. And whilst they're not entire, they can never be entirely separate, can they? Of course they can't. But one isn't supposed to be controlling the other. They're supposed to be a 
a, a large degree of independence between all of all three of those bodies okay that has broken down that has absolutely broken down we saw it during covid where where boris johnson simply made announcements about what the law was and about what the guidance was and nobody knew the difference between a law and guidance and the police didn't seem to care because they simply went out and they policed guidance as though it were law so there we have a breakdown between the, the between the separation of powers we then have the judiciary who who over the last few years have been operating on what's called the um, the judicial uh, the ju judicial bench book if you read the judicial bench book it is a love letter to wokery it is an absolute love letter to wokery and the introduction tells judges not that they have to follow the book but that they should follow the book so for instance, if you're accused of racism, if you're accused of misogyny, if you're accused of any of these sort of hot topics, then you the last thing you want to do is look at the judicial uh, bench book because you're already guilty, according to that. What you're relying on is getting a judge who is independent-minded enough, stubborn enough to ignore what the judiciary bench book has told him to do. That's that's it. That, that that's it. So we have we have a position where the judiciary are coming under the influence of government and the police are coming under the influence of government. And at that point, we have, in effect, a police state. So Elon Musk is right. Yeah. And f frankly, this means that there is no rule of law because the the less well, there is a there, 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 is, there is a rule of law, but it's an illegitimate. It's, a, it's an illegitimate law and it's a law based on the wrong model like you, you look at Maoist China there, were, there was definitely the rule of law but there was no separation of powers yeah uh, and so there was no sense of real honest justice we still have in this country one of the most admired justice systems on the planet where Britain goes other countries go but we are in danger of losing it Ronald Reagan was absolutely right when he said every generation we are just one generation away from tyranny one generation away from tyranny and that's why we have to be aware of what's going on here and elon musk is right he is absolutely correct we're not a police state like you had in haiti under pol pot we're not a police state like we had under stalin or under hitler but we are in a police state Hi folks, thanks for watching. We really appreciate all of your support because of course, without you guys actually subscribing to LoadSeas.com, none of this would be possible because YouTube has decided we're on the naughty list and are not allowed to monetize our videos. So if you'd like to support us, go to LoadSeas.com, sign up, and go and watch Dan Tubbs' amazing series, Brokenomics, about this particular episode, about the economic consequences of the riots in England, because there are of course going to be some and negative ones. And go and follow us on x at lotusitas underscore com.